Yeah. I went... I you remember when I went to Sedona to represent your film at the Sedona Film Festival in Arizona. I didn't... The shortest distance wasn't to go through Denver, but I chose to go through Denver. And it was a great experience. Denver's a great city. Um, you know, lots of EVs, lots of clean energy, lots of good people, lots of... But the, the trip from... Denver on the uh, interstate that they built, I think, in the 80s or even early 90s. It was, it was the newest interstate, pretty much. They decided to finally put the interstate between Denver and Utah, uh, Grand Junction, in um, do it. So it's actually a, a stunning, beautiful drive that I don't think you should miss. Um, and... Well, especially in the summertime, <laughs> not in the wintertime. I wouldn't necessarily say take it in the wintertime because it's very much a lots of, you know, but they've got some interesting signs there for truckers. Like they say, we're not kidding. You know, the next uh, 20 miles is going to be hell yeah. or something like that. They've got weird things that get your attention, <laughs> but it's, it's quite beautiful. And you can stop along the side of the road. There's some big tunnels and things. And it's just, uh, yeah, Denver is an amazing city that is relatively close to us. I mean compared to some things and uh, directly south of us, by the way, if you're wondering geographically on a map where we are, we're about 12 hours drive north of Denver and I would highly recommend it. And then you got a crap load of amazing national parks in the area, like uh, Canyon lands and uh, um, you know, you get into Utah, there's a, just some stunning national parks and you're not far away from the Grand Canyon. Have you been? No, I've never been to the Grand Canyon. Highly recommend it, Brian. You're a retired man, a little bit of money in the bank. You've got a Model S that can go far. I think now okay. is your time. I strongly urge you to hit the Grand Canyon because it is, and it's not just one thing. You don't just pull up and say, oh, it's gorgeous. Let's go home. You drive along it or you take a bus to different stops and it's a completely different view at different stops. And if you want to die, you can hike down to the canyon floor and not make yeah, it no, back. Not but that's that. one way. One, one way to enter. Maybe there's a ramp and I can <laughs> jump the Snake River Canyon. Well, sure. In your Tesla Model S, you can give it a try. <laughs> and be sure to roll audio on that for the show. But there's just, there's a ton of national parks that are uh, stunning and gorgeous in their own way. And then you get into geography like like you would see on uh, Roadrunner, yeah. you know, like the Roadrunner inspired geography, which I, I've always wanted to see. And I finally saw it a few years ago and, and just love it when I went to Sedona. It's well, just we're booked stunning. into Deadwood, South Dakota for the trip down there, but the other stops we haven't quite figured out yet. So I will, I'll take that advice. I encourage you to yeah. look at the map, look at a map, look around. And it's a great time of year to do it because it's a uh, shoulder yeah. season, right? It's before winter. So if there's any mountains you're dealing with, you don't have to worry about that. And then you got um, people back at school and families not vacation, so it's a perfect time of year. I, uh, you'd be crazy not to. It's just uh, I, I. This is what I hope to do one day. Shoulder season because of this, the national parks are so busy now, uh, everywhere, and especially rebounding after people discovered the outdoors during the pandemic for some reason. I don't know why, but they did, and yeah, it's a thing now. So that's. That's just that. Anyway, I have some further thoughts of my vacation that I talked about in depth last week. Um, I just want to remind people what I did as an EV enthusiast and advocate is I checked in on plug share. Uh, a lot of people aren't doing that, but unless there's a problem, but you have the time, uh, just uh, click the plug share button. It'll know where you are and just say I'm charging and how much you're getting and it'll help. And um, a better route planner, what I'm planning on doing is getting a dongle that works with a better route planner that you can plug into the little computer port that cars have. It's called OBD2 right, or something yeah. like that. Uh, I have one for my Leaf, but it doesn't work. It's You need a Bluetooth low energy one, a more modern one to work with a better route planner. So that's the app that you use to plan your EV stops, your charging stops with a non-Tesla. It's built into Teslas, you bastards. It's right part of your dash, but Rivian recently bought it. But my point is that I could have a bit of a Tesla experience because it will take data from the car, like how much energy is left, how much energy is being used. And I can get that same experience on the screen of my car or not the same experience perhaps, but uh, it's supposed to take weather and terrain into it too, if you buy the monthly fee. So I would, I took a, I used it with a, like a free trial for a week or two weeks rather during my vacation. And I'll probably just buy it for a month at a time when I do take vacations in the future, just so I have that. 
Um, but I came out, you know, I learned a lot from that trip. I, I feel like I, I'm, there's a lot that I can add to our conversations now that I didn't know before and to, to our listeners. I, I really learned by doing. And, but I have the strong, strong, strong feeling that Tesla will be the only charging network I will use and everyone else will too. Now, I only had a couple of times where I had to move chargers. To, I had to drive to a different charger out of, you know, 20 charging stops. Two of those maybe were things that didn't work and I had to drive somewhere else. That's a pain in the butt if you're in a hurry. Uh, and even if you're not in a hurry, you don't want that to happen. Why would I let that happen? I wouldn't. I would just go to Tesla chargers. And sometimes, you know, the Tesla chargers would be like, 15 stalls and then there'd be two flow charges for non-tesla vehicles and there'd still only be a couple of vehicles at the tesla chargers you know i've rarely saw i saw them full once like a six pack of charges yeah. full once but there was actually another supercharged station in that town so i don't think it's going to be a problem if it happened today uh you know because you only got a couple of ev drivers that could go there at any given time so i i think that you know i was worried about that last week i was worried that what's going to happen if we all do that because we will and don't invest in these other guys because they're going to go out of business they have to i mean i just can't see them surviving against the tesla network unless tesla charges so much and they might who knows uh that you know it might be worth it sometimes to go or maybe it's near a restaurant you want to go to or it's by your hotel but for the most part, I can't see wasting my time not planning a route with just Tesla chargers. Yeah, well, they definitely have a long way to go to compete against Tesla and to get up to the same level of service. But it's possible. It'll just take some time. Yeah, years, though. I mean, they're years and years away from, from that happening. And, you know, a year from now, they're just going to start this you know, this, um, charging network between the auto companies, the OE, original manufacturers of automobiles, some of them have gotten together and they're going to start a network, but that's going to take years. And Tesla, my guess is that T Tesla will be ahead and they'll, they'll see congestion at chargers. They'll build new ones because they're very good at that, as you've said in the past. And, you know, it'll be a constant catch up and, and, and I, I don't see them, working out very well. There's a lot of people that say, well, the auto dealership should get chargers. Well, most of them won't let people charge at them. I mean, my dealership who sold me the Bolt is going to get one and they say it's for public use, but that would have been great in a lot of towns, but the towns, they park ICE vehicles in front of them and they, they have this, well, it, it's where we live. I mean, it's not like that at everywhere in the world. We live in a people, a state with, or a province with a lot of dummies in it, but it'd be one app and one procedure. Okay, so the number one reason is that the stall availability, there's a six stalls instead of two. Sometimes there's, I, maybe once I saw three flow chargers at a place, well, the, you, you're running the risk of them being full, even if you check in, and sometimes you can't check in. So you don't know all the time if they're going to be full. The Tesla chargers will, aren't competently networked, and they will tell you. So I could, I could pick like a V1 supercharger in my car, for example, because the V1s are 150 kilowatts and a lot of cars don't do beyond that. So it wouldn't even matter which charge. I could just pick that and not bother people like you who would be faster charging at those places. Although they have to solve the problem of, you know, taking, you have to, if a bolt, you have to take up two stalls right now at the Tesla chargers because the, the cords, cords are on the short, wrong you have side to park and in a weird short. way. Yeah. No, Tesla's ahead so I don't and know they're not going to stop. Like they're, the, the stat is they're opening a new supercharger station somewhere in the world every 13 hours. So um, the, the lead, if anything, at this point is probably just accelerating. So yeah, you would, you would, I would show up and I know there'd be a whole bunch of chargers and a good chance that one would be free. Uh, I'd use one app, one procedure, and the reliability is there. I don't have to worry about that. Why would I mess around? Well, you know, I if they're there... And, and it's working. I don't see other people competing with that when you're planning a road trip. It's just not going to work. I mean, if you're in an apartment, it's one thing. But, you know, the Tesla fast chargers, I've got a graph here for you, Brian. It's, they're way ahead of everybody else. And especially with the fast charging, there's very few people that are having many chargers. That's what I found beyond 100 yeah, kilowatts. Electric, Electrify America looks like they're about one quarter the number of charging connectors um, compared to Tesla. And of course, we know that um, often they're not working. 
And in Canada, they have Electrify Canada, the Canadian version of that, that is starting to kick up. They're putting one in our city. Ford says that you will have to pay for that adapter, that CCS to Tesla adapter. And it's going to be manufactured by Tesla, the Ford CEO said recently. And then they also said the Tesla adapter is capable of two-way power. Uh, but pain will be done through Ford's app. And it sounds like what it's going to happen with other people too, is that you're going to go through your own app. And I hope they don't take a cut off of that. So I looked at my trip from last week and um, basically I looked at all the places where it was busy and where I was running into trouble. And I noticed that, uh, well, Merritt BC was the place where I had to skip town and not charge at all because the, you know, it was a long weekend and the fast food lineups, so we couldn't even get lunch very easily. And the Tesla you know, places were busy and the, the, they laughed, they literally laughed at me, Brian, at the flow charger. I said, uh, the, uh, <laughs> I, I, they just laughed. They said, no, go away. There's a whole bunch of people waiting. So, but if I've showed up at Merritt, BC, this town that is at the beginning of the Coca-Cola highway, you know, between two places, um, well, there's three Tesla supercharging sites, three, because it's incredible. Like that just blows my mind. It's a small town, but it's the place that needs them and they're built. Yeah. Well, Tesla, they've got obviously the data on where their cars go and they've got data on where the chargers are busy. They've got data on everything. So, um, and they're proactive, and they're proactive on, it. on it, you know, hence they put a charger in Davidson over three years ago in their, our, you know, weird, small Canadian province, but you know, they were three years ahead of anybody else putting in any other charger. So I hightailed it over the Coquihalla Highway, this amazing engineering feat to Hope, BC, another small little town. There was two Tesla sites there, and including a 24 stall site uh, next door in the adjacent town, 24 stalls. So yeah, and then Revelstoke, there was two different Tesla sites there, four plus eight. It's a tight little town, not a lot of room because of the mountains. Golden had... Uh, two two sites canmore had two sites whistler though that uh mountain resort town didn't have much it had a couple in a parkade and there's just no parking in in whistler there's no free right. space to put up stuff like that you know, and but, these are all the places i went three years ago when i did my first trip to vancouver when i first got the tesla and there was only one supercharger site at all of these places like merit and hope and they were kind of busy especially on the weekend um, but a lot can change in three years. But to this day, Calgary, a city of what, how much, how big is it? One and a half million people is yeah. pretty big for a Canadian prairie city. It's more than that. It's, I think it's bigger. Anyway, it's a huge city because one Tesla supercharger. Yeah, the so second far, one is under construction. One. So that should be out soon. Well, I hope it's like a million stalls yeah, there. It'll be a million stalls. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's time for James's podcast corner. We don't have an intro, but I was listening to the uh, Canadian uh, Public Broadcaster, CBC, the Under the Influence podcast, or radio show and now podcast, and it was back then, it was called um, The Age of Persuasion, I yeah. think, back then, so 10 years, or 12 years ago, but uh, they had a repeat episode, I was minding my own business, driving my Nissan Leaf, and they were talking, you know, 12 years ago about the Nissan Leaf, this is what they had to say. The Nissan LEAF had to deal with a different issue, namely that electric cars make no sound, which can be problematic for seeing and hearing impaired pedestrians. The LEAF needed audio visibility. In a four-year international study, Nissan consulted acoustic experts, universities, a Hollywood sound company, and the National Federation for the Blind to test for the most appropriate sound. 100 were developed and from that list this sound was chosen for going forward and this sound was chosen when moving in reverse it's interesting to me that nissan chose a sound that was futuristic it not only solved the problem of the electric car's audio visibility, but it also created the impression of leading technology. Now, look at all the work they went to just for the yeah. sound. 
four years four years of international <laughs> research, and then they just they couldn't put in a liquid cool battery system to thermally manage their battery but packs. Does your Nissan Leaf actually make those sounds? Uh, yes, exactly like that. Yes, the, the no, it's, the reverse is different. The reverse is more of a beeping sound. So that was the first eleven and twelve yeah. model, and they changed it at the end. But yeah. Um, I noticed that, you know, when I heard a Tesla in a par hotel park, hey, they're very loud. Their sounds are a bit more than they maybe well, need to be. Well, just because it was in a park very, aid, but. It, it amplifies it. You don't normally hear it that well, and you need to hear it out in the open, I guess. But, uh, yeah, my actually, my wife said, well, why didn't they put that money, that research money into a uh, thermally managed battery? Even she knows uh, about that problem. All right, it's time for another new segment called Brian's. Light bulb nook. Play the theme song, James. Brian's light bulb hey, nook. Uh, so this is something we talk about. It's not a corner. It's a, it's nook. a nook. Just to no, clarify, I had to go to the. It's different I had to than go a corner. To the thesaurus and come up with another word for corner. <laughs> did, did you really? Do that, <laughs> the work we put into the show, people, you don't appreciate anyway, it. So we do talk about energy efficient light bulbs every once in a while. It is a favorite topic of mine. I was an early adopter of energy efficient light bulbs because I just can't stand the waste involved in an incandescent bulb. A hundred watt bulb and something like 90 watts of that is wasted as heat. They're just incredibly inefficient. Now, they do produce really pleasing light, but slowly but surely the technology for energy efficient bulbs has been getting better. And I came across this review on YouTube and it's a channel called The Hookup. And this guy did an insane amount of work to compare 25 different light bulbs. And I wanted to give it a shout out because it's a pretty big channel. He's got a few hundred thousand subscribers, but there's only about 25,000 views on this video. And I think it's because uh, most people are just bored by light bulbs, I guess. I don't know. It's Well, in the States, you, you have new policy that says you have to have LED finally. Yeah. The rest of the world has been way ahead of you. Like, it's just a, an incredible waste yeah. not to. And there uh, are loopholes where like certain like uh, oven, like if you need a light bulb for your oven, they're going to allow those to continue as incandescent. I've yet to find a, an LED bulb for my oven. Have no, you? no, I don't think for whatever reason, that's, that's a hard thing to do. So for people who love incandescent light bulbs, you're always going to be able to find a way to, to get them. I think, um, I had, uh, my former, um, my, my brother's former mother-in-law, uh, she's deceased now, but she stocked up when the uh, ban came yeah. into effect 12 years ago or whatever yeah. it was. She stocked up on incandescent light bulbs. She probably still could sell them on eBay for well, a million dollars. There's probably a radicals. website. Like, you can probably just import them from another country if you need it. Like, it, you know, I, I think there's always ways around it. But... Like Cuban yeah. cigars. There's always a way. But the... The amazing thing about this review that this guy did on uh, on his channel, The Hookup on YouTube, is the technology, I think, has finally reached the point where... Now, unfortunately, it's not all bulbs. Like, So he reviewed 25 different bulbs. and the, But the best bulbs are basically now indistinguishable from incandescent bulbs. And there was one kind of expensive bulb there, 20 or $25 a bulb. And I forget the name of it. And I don't think anyone's going to want to buy one because they also, they don't... No. They don't dim. So it's sort of a limited use case. But in all of these metrics, he actually found this one LED bulb outperformed the incandescent in terms of, like, these are the things that he looked at. It's scientific. It's yeah. depth. It's, it's it, it, instruments so he are looked involved. At color rendering, like the, like the light spectrum. That's what incandescent bulbs have always been good at. They, they, a very even light spectrum. You get all you know, colors of the rainbow in the spectrum, whereas in, you know, LEDs and compact fluorescence, you often get a spike in the blue light and the green light and that, that kind right. of ruins them. But, um, especially if you're lighting a living yeah. room or in, you have paintings and just yeah, general decor, it just kind of throws things off. You want your light off. to be accurate always. And it's more pleasing that way too. So he looked at the color rendering, the power efficiency, like, did it actually output the amount of light that it said it was for the wattage that it was? Um, he looked at flicker, um, and that's another complaint, more common in fluorescence, but people complain about flicker in these bulbs, which is often imperceptible, but some people are sensitive to it. Um, but even incandescent bulbs actually flicker because it, it works on the 60 hertz 
uh, electricity really? cycle. Yeah, most people don't oh, know, I didn't know that. Ever th- but um, you're... You've got to get out a high-speed camera and record yes. this, Brian. You have to do this but right the thing now. With an incandescent I'll stop bulb, recording. Like it's, it's heating up a filament, a tungsten filament. So even though the power is shutting on and off 60 times a second, um, the filament basically stays lit the whole time because that's just the nature of right, the... Right, it's glowing. You know, it, it hasn't it cooled down. It takes too long to sort of cool down. But um, then he looked at the longevity. Like he, That's difficult. Like a lot of these LED bulbs, they say, oh, it'll last 10 years, it'll last 20 years, it'll last 20,000 hours or whatever. That is difficult to test because you can't wait you know, 20 years to do that um, if you're making a YouTube video. But he disassembled all of these bulbs and used his expertise to kind of look at how they're all constructed and then make a guess about how long they're going to last, also based on the temperature that they're putting out. So he put all of these things where he was measuring, you, you, you leave the light bulb on. Boy, this is so down your um, alley. You must have I'd been love, on If we hadn't nine, started this podcast, a... I, I think I would have started a <laughs> light bulb review channel. I just, I just love this stuff. There's still Although, time. I don't, I don't think I'm patient enough to do all the work that, that this guy did, which is... There's a lot of work. I'm, I'm giving him a nice plug here, but... You'd also need a lab coat, yeah, I think. So, he disassembled them, saw how they were constructed, and then took temperature readings because the hotter the bulb runs, the more likely it is to kind of burn out quickly. And then also dimming performance. This is another problem with LED bulbs. They don't, some of them don't dim at all. And then some of them, it can be difficult to dim them. But basically the result of this is um, uh, to cut to the chase. If you want to buy a really nice, pleasing light bulb with excellent color, good dimming performance, color rendering, all these things. It's the Philips Ultra Definition 60-watt equivalent bulb. That's what he determined was the best. There was that other more expensive one that did beat in some categories, but those are $20, $25 a bulb or something. Um, that seems kind of not particularly relevant, and that one's not dimmable. But, um, you know, these are about $3 a bulb, so they're not the cheapest. But I don't think you want to go for the cheapest when you're shopping for light bulbs. Um, so like $3 American, about $5 Canadian. The Philips Ultra Definition 60 watt equivalent. These have, you know, excellent, basically indistinguishable from an incandescent bulb. Brian, all my bulbs are smart bulbs. I don't mess with dumb bulbs yeah, anymore. Yeah, these are dumb bulbs. They're not connected. Um, so, you know, that could be a deal breaker for you, but I have a lot of light bulbs in my house. So a lot of them don't have to be smart bulbs, like the ones in this room that I use once a week. But, um, I will say too, that I do have a lot of Phillips bulbs and some of them have died prematurely. I don't know if you've had that experience. Not yet. I'm worried about that because I do have some expensive, um, smart color bulbs that at the time were like 50, yeah, 60 bucks I had a couple of those die two. on me. So... You know, Ugh. word of caution. But the thing is, I enjoy buying light bulbs so much that I actually don't mind when they die because then I'm, I get all excited because then I get to buy another light bulb. <laughs> there are not that many light bulb nerds in the world. You are in a unique company. So Brian's light bulb nook should have its yeah, own Yeah, but intro. I thought that was super really useful. Should. Phillips Ultra Definition, or if you're really interested, look up uh, the hookup on uh, YouTube for their in-depth light bulb review. And you know, this all makes sense to me. It's just, it's like, there's better technology that happens to use less energy. It's right up our alley. It's like everything else we're interested in, whether it's cars or solar energy or wind, uh, it just makes sense. And it's something that we look forward to. We, we expect the world but to But it improve. has taken a long time to get to this point where they're indistinguishable and not all of them are. The cheaper ones are not indistinguishable. They have a blue spike, they have a green spike. So. Be careful, like 90% of the time, 90% of the people can't tell the difference, even on the cheaper bulbs. But if you're picky about this kind of stuff, we are finally at the point where they are indistinguishable. Well, that's good news. Brian, last week you brought up a sad story of the week, and that was that our province next door, the oil and gas capital of Canada, Alberta, which I drove through, and I may not drive through again. You know, I may just boycott them. I may just just power through and get to British Columbia and not give them any of my hotel money because, God, I hate them. Uh, they've got a new premier who is um, kind of U.S. style. She's into conspiracy theories. Uh, Daniel Smith is her name. And for some reason, the province voted for her, largely the rural areas. But, you know, 
it, the thing about this moratorium that you mentioned last week, it's a solar and wind moratorium. They're going to stop invest, stop new projects from being built. Well, the thing is, what grabbed my attention was that it's it's more than the six months that the headline said. It's actually seven months, and it's twenty five billion dollars. Like the province is, you know, not the smallest jurisdiction in the world, but that is a fortune of money that they are turning away and shooting themselves in the foot, just shooting themselves in the foot over and over You're again. Sam style. Exactly. Why? Why would they be so stupid just to appease rural residents who are worried? Like, you know, uh, polling says that half the people in Alberta consider themselves tied to oil and gas strongly. So I guess that they're, they're threatened by it. But come on. That's just, you're, you're turning away $25 billion? It's amazing what governments do for social conservative concerns of the people who get their information on Facebook. It's yeah, just amazing. Yeah, they're doing it for votes. It helps them with votes. So they have a commission there that is in charge of the various electrical grids. And they said that, yes, we can get to net zero by 2035. Here's three pathways. And she says we can't get to net zero. And our dipshit premier, Scott Moe is his name, total jackwagon, which is a, uh, a term that his predecessor coined for all intents and purposes, jackwagon. Feel free to use that. I, I've started using it since then over the last 10 years. Maz is a total jackwagon. The thing is, he's lying to us. He's lying to us saying our, our electricity bill will double if we go... Like double, not just go yeah. up. And, you know, CBC finally did a story on it later and said, well, no, these experts said that, you know, one study said, you know, nothing. And the other study said 0.9 cents per kilowatt. Well, it's not like our electricity is not going to go up 0.9 cents a kilowatt over the next 10, 15 years. It's going to anyway, right? So it's it's not that significant. They just don't want to. They don't want to threaten the small and medium oil and gas people that are funding their campaigns. And Daniel Smith in Alberta suggested that the science and climate change is unsettled. But um, our friend over at the um, energy um, media, um, Mark, Mark energy, energy Media with an I at the end of energy, uh, Markham Hislap, he interviewed uh, Dwayne Bratt, political science professor at Mount Royal University. M Markham is a energy journalist and doing good work uh, out of BC, but formerly from Alberta. Um, basically this guy says there's a huge threat of wind and solar and the people who fund that political party. And, um, yeah, he was a little bit cynical about, well, about the people who, uh, who say, Hey, let's go nuclear. Cause our province is doing that too. Some of the people who are most anti, uh, solar and wind are actually pro nuclear. I'm not sure they're actually pro-nuclear as much as they are using nuclear as a stick to beat up environmentalists. Yeah, I have no, you know, the federal government just gave $74 million to our province to explore nuclear, small modular, which doesn't yep. exist yet, uh, as unproven, and certainly not cheap by the time we need it in, in ten, a little over 10 years. I have no, we're not going to have nuclear reactors here. They have no intention of doing it. It's a delay tactic. It's a... It's a piss off the environmentalist tactic. So now you look at the oil and gas sector today, you've got the Pathways Alliance, which is a global conglomerate, the Alberta base, but they operate around the world. They know what is coming uh, and they are trying to prepare for it. And we can say, well, whether they're moving fast enough or in the right direction, they do have a sense of what's happened. But the mid-sized um, and juniors, they don't operate that way. And therefore, this is a this is a defensive mechanism. You know, they're not looking for 2050. <laughs> they're looking to get through the next five years, the next 10 years. The future will take care of itself. We need defensive action now. Think about what this seven month uh, moratorium does, Brian. If you were an investor and you were saying, well, I'm gonna take my investment of $100 million into solar in Alberta, would you do that? And he says, no, it's not just a seven month moratorium. It's a complete shutting down of it. It's it's more than that. It's a signal. Six months, seven months. It's more than that because it's a signal. They are signaling to 
very large developers, you are not welcome here. All right, that is rep that is a long term reputational damage because even though they're not using the language of climate change uh, by attacking wind and solar, and there's no other way of saying it, it's a direct attack on it, that will have a long term reputational damage well beyond seven months. Even if this moratorium lifts in February, would you risk millions, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars to invest in Alberta? thinking they could do it again six weeks from now, six months from now. And think about the reputational damage that this may indeed cause Alberta. It's, it's too early to tell, but this could have long-term economic ramifications that we're not thinking through because we're so fixated on the now. Shooting themselves in the foot, Brian. Shooting themselves right in the foot. And the Alberta website says in 2015, because I mentioned last week to your surprise that uh, they're going to burn their last lump of coal this week. I went and double-checked that because uh, I wanted to make sure. And yeah, that's true. Um, that's what's anticipated to happen. Their own website says that was linked to, uh, from a CBC article. In 2015, the government announced the elimination of emissions from coal power generations to occur by 2030. But Alberta will be fully transitioned from coal power electricity by the end of 2023, reflecting industry and our government's shared commitment yeah, right, to global leadership and environmental, social and governance outcomes, which are increasingly driving investment decisions. And that is true. You know, the investment decisions, like we said on the show, are being driven by how clean is your grid? Do I have to provide my own clean electricity or are my investors in my company going to get on me for my emissions? So shooting themselves in the foot over and over and over. Same here. I'm yeah. done. And if you're a company like Amazon, you want to put up a, a warehouse somewhere, you want it to be powered by clean electricity, this all factors into this. So why they'd be discouraging uh, companies like Amazon from coming in and doing business is very weird to me from a pro-business party. Okay, so uh, moving on to um, another story here from Electrek. So uh, last week we reported on the advancements happening in uh, solar panel factories and uh, battery storage factories in the U.S. that have happened as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S. So another kind of follow-up story this week from uh, Electrek, and this is about the auto sector. And this comes from uh, the Environmental Defense Fund and an engineering and design firm, WSP USA. So uh, very similar to last week's story, we were talking about roughly $100 billion in new investment in solar and uh, grid storage from the Inflation Reduction Act. And the numbers are very similar for the auto sector. They figure it at $92.4 billion of concrete investments in EV and EV battery factories in the U.S. as a result of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. So The auto industry is putting gobs of money into this, as are the battery factories. There's a new one in Quebec this week announced as yes. well. And this is with great encouragement from uh, the U.S. government and uh, the subsidies they're providing. I think the job figure for solar last week was 20,000. The job figure for EVs is 80,000. I guess making cars is a much more labor intensive kind of uh, industry. So um, a similar number overall with 92 million in investments. Um, so um, but here's a couple of amazing statistics as well from this story. By 2026, so after all this gets built, a lot of these are just announcements. Uh, by 2026, U.S. EV manufacturing facilities will be able to make about 4.7 million passenger EVs annually. That'll be 36% of what's made now. That's by 2026. And then by 2027, they'll be able to produce 12.2 million new passenger vehicles, which represents 95% of new vehicles sold based on what's being sold right now. So, Well, that's good news. We talk about this all the time. When is this going to happen? When is it going to be all EV? This suggests in the U.S. it could be as soon as 2027. Once the manufacturing capacity is there, that 95% of the vehicles are electric, 
uh, you know, who's going to buy those 5% gas vehicles? It's going to be kind of a very specific um, sort of thing. So the biggest uh, states for these EV manufacturing uh, investments and jobs would be Georgia, Michigan, and Tennessee. So they're the ones that are going to benefit the most, but there are several other states the, in the running here. Um, you know, this is a real horse race here. Like, I'd, I'd be excited to see this actually come to pass by, by 2027 if this can all, uh, you know, get built and happen. Georgia is almost twice as much investment in jobs as Michigan. You know, it's, it's uh, Georgia's benefiting and the Republicans want to take all this away. And that just doesn't I mean, it's jobs. They're, yeah. they're shooting themselves in the foot. Again, you know, just pro, like Alberta. Pro-business pro parties being anti-business. Um, you know, I, the, uh, the CEO of Ford, Jim Farley, is that his name? He went, yep. uh, he took uh, a Ford F-150 Lightning electric truck, one of his products, on a bit of a road trip. And he had some, uh, you know, stark realizations because I think it took him 40 minutes to charge from zero to 40 percent and they realized that's not good enough it only charges at 150 now that may be good for an efficient small medium-sized car but for a big pickup truck you're going to have to do lots of charging if you're towing and stuff like that and it's going to have to do better than it's going to have to do a lot better than 150 kilowatts yeah the bigger the battery the longer it takes to charge so you better speed up that charging that's for sure. And, you know, the less damage it'll take, it'll probably have a pretty good charging curve. If it's a big battery like that, you can get it to at least 70 or 80% perhaps. Um, but my point is there's a long way to go. And I've had a bit of a revelation when that happened. I, cause you know, I was dissing the Cybertruck last week. Well, the Cybertruck sort of kicked the other OEMs in the butt when it announced their stuff. Yeah. I think it's, it's probably going to do it again when you start comparing the two, okay? Like it might have similar towing, it might have similar payload, but the, it might have similar range, but the charging aspect is almost certainly, wouldn't you say, going to be a lot faster in the Cybertruck than say the 150 in the, the F-150, for example. Yeah, and it remains to be seen if how serious Ford is about making these things. They've got this balance of having to make the gas versions and they're kind of losing money on the EV version, so they don't want to make too many. But we know Tesla's going to come roaring out of the gate and make as many as they possibly can. So, you know, in terms of volume, there's going to be probably more Cybertrucks available uh, for the foreseeable future. So, you know, how when do much you think this? When do you think the announcement's going to happen? I, I can't wait. I'm looking forward to seeing what the next few years are going to be like from yeah, this announcement. Yeah, so there's been lots of sightings of kind of prototype uh, Cybertrucks around. So people are expecting the first delivery event to be probably about two months from now, probably in September or maybe oh. October. And uh, it'll be a slow ramp up, of course, maybe a couple thousand delivered this year. But then, you know, maybe the tens of thousands next year. Well, the point is, they didn't have to deliver any, and they shook up the, the automotive industry, right? I mean, yeah. that was a big deal. The the Ford F-150 Lightning electric truck would not exist without the Cybertruck announcement. And I'd be surprised if there weren't any technical technical revelations that, you know, were surprising and sort of, you know, some sort of uh, feat that it will blow the competition out of the water. Now, people may not want to look at it. Yeah. That might be an issue, and I contend that it, it, it very well could be in a couple of years after everyone buys them up. But um, Well, they're a couple this... of years late, of course, in delivering them. It's taken them way longer than they were expecting to actually get them out the door. So I think a lot of that's going to be underneath. A lot of that's going to be in the manufacturing. Like, they've spent probably the extra time to get the manufacturing right because they need to make these things at scale and make them at a profit which uh, everybody else is still struggling with. So that part, I feel like they're probably going to have that nailed and they're going to be making uh, money like crazy on these things while everyone else still struggles. So Rethink X, the uh, think tank of uh, professors who study uh, disruption of past disruption and current disruption and future disruption of technology and economics of that technology, uh, Tony Seba was one of the people that a lot of people have watched presentations with. Well, Adam Dore is one of their people too, and he's been putting out some videos lately, and he's got a series out now. Uh, one of them touched on why we shouldn't waste our time with nuclear. 
And to those who are pro-nuclear, and I know there's a lot of them, if nuclear was going to be a solution, it would be the solution. Nobody's making nuclear, hardly anybody. And we don't have time, you know, the, 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 the time to do it would be now. And the reason it's not happening is largely economic and also a little bit, you know, I'm sure there's a, a variety of reasons, but largely it's economic. You know, it takes investment from, from governments to actually make it happen. And that's not necessarily the best deal for taxpayers. So I'm going to go through his video on this and just touch the points very quickly because we're running out of time. Uh, vastly more expensive, not even close. Clean energy can come in at a small fraction of the cost. Uh, with no risk. Now, he argues, and they've studied this, that solar, wind, plus batteries, which are all coming down in price, some faster than others, wind's a bit slower pace, but they're all coming down, and a mixture of them in different geographic locations is cheaper than nuclear. And in fact, it comes in at a fraction of the cost, okay? And that's, that's the estimated cost, not what the final cost of nuclear. So solar, wind, and batteries are able to do the task. In some cases, the cost of security alone for a nuclear plant can be more than the all-in cost of solar. Can you believe that? I mean, he showed examples of people with machine guns patrolling. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on where you are in the world and how much security you have, but that's just a stark analysis. And one of my favorite stats about uh, clean energy is the fuel costs are zero. So, you know, with a nuclear power plant, it's not as bad probably as uh, a gas plant where you got to always pay for the gas. You got to pay for the uranium to run it, and, and that's not a small cost, and it's going to probably keep going up. It's not just uranium, and I'll, I'll touch on some other things, too. There's other rare minerals. Uh, 30 times more expensive and getting worse. It's not getting better. Nuclear plants, in order to meet uh, safety concerns that they've learned about, are getting more expensive. And just everything's becoming more expensive. And because they're not making very many of them, there's not the expertise, and it's taking longer. Uh, there's a negative experience cor uh, curve rather than a positive one that we have for everything else, computers, solar, uh, we the more we build, the more expensive it's becoming. And even without red tape in some countries, you can't blame it all on red tape, uh, that's what's happening because it's, we're learning that it takes more to make them safe, therefore more expensive. So there's problems uh, when they occur at nuclear plants, and they always do. They're costly. France had half of their reactors on, offline due to uh, a defect in the pipes, in the plumbing. So the localized or the levelized cost of electricity, the price per unit of electricity that you compare these things at, assumes that a nuclear power plant, when we hear these things, are going to run at 90%, and they never do. They don't run at 90%. They have to, um, you know, either get special treatment to sell all of its electricity when wind and solar are high, instead of turning down the things that you're actually consuming for. So that raises the cost, and it's more than you thought. Uh, yeah, so nuclear is actually offline 10% of the year for maintenance, which is more than a month. Uh, too much water. It's using a, a lot of water. In France, 75% of the country's electricity comes from nuclear, but 50% of the freshwater withdrawals are coming from nuclear plants. That is to say, they're consuming fresh water, and they have a lot of fresh water, but it's a bit of an issue. Uh, you need to cool water. You need to have cool water for cooling. It can't be just a little bit cooler. It has to be substantially cooler than what you're trying to cool. Otherwise, it doesn't work very well. Heat waves um, have shut down the ecosystem in rivers. Uh, or, pardon me, heat, heat waves have shut down power plants, nuclear power plants, because if you cool the power plant and you output really hot water into the river, you kill the ecosystem. So that's an issue, and that's becoming more of a problem. We see headlines all the time on the show. Uh, you need political stability to operate. So that's why there's only 33 countries with nuclear power plants now. The other 660 that still have to decarbonize to save the planet, um, you know, they're not stable enough. So you can't really power the world with it. And the scale has to be constrained due to cost. Big is better so far, so saying that small molecular nuclear is a long ways away from ever having a shot at competing with the uh, cost effectiveness of one big ass nuclear plant. All nuclear plants carry a risk of nuclear weapon prolifer proliferation. That is an issue, as you know, everyone knows. And uh, long build times, two years siting, eight years build, 10 years in total. A country could switch, he says, to wind, solar, and battery in that time before the first plant even came online. And yeah, those We'd have to be citing plants today in order to meet our deadline. So when we're not, so I don't see how people say nuclear is the answer. If it is, 
you should phone somebody. I don't know who, but you know, it's not my fault. Uh, reusing nuclear materials is a thought, but it really hasn't happened after decades and billions of dollars of research in that area. A lot of people say, we'll just reuse the, the stuff, but that hasn't happened. Uh, nuclear reactors need uranium and a bunch of other rare minerals. Did you know that, Brian? It's not just uranium. I can't list them because I can't even pronounce some of them. But so mining raw materials is still an issue. People say, well, you have to raw, you know, rare materials for batteries. Well, you have to just the same for nuclear reactors. And it's not just uranium. So nuclear reactors have to be down uh, 10% of the year, as I said, for maintenance. Nuclear waste is still an unsolved issue, especially with the transportation. I mean, can you imagine a rail disaster with nuclear waste? I mean, oil is bad enough and, and chlorine and all that, but my God. Uh, siting constraints, you need a big exclusion zone in some countries like Singapore, you know, just there's no room for it. Um, so you have to either put rooftop solar on or, you know, bring in energy from another country. Plus the risk of disaster. Uh, the accident rate right now is one per 1500 power plant years of operation. So to run all of civilization, and this includes electric vehicles and electric heating that we're going to have to do, you'd need upwards of 20 times more plants. Uh, more for transport and heating, as I said. So 18,000 power plants in the world. But if you look at that statistically, Brian, that'd be an accident every month at our current rate of accidents if we had all those reactors. Yikes. Nobody wants that. Can you imagine? What's the nuclear disaster this month? I mean, <laughs> it, it, it shakes up an entire generation when it happens. So that's my rant. I'm done. Yeah, and, you know, I just love the simplicity of this. Like, if you and I had to... We could go online, order up a bunch of solar panels, order up a bunch of batteries, and literally build our own power plant. That's how much simpler it is. Yeah. And you and I could not build a nuclear power plant. but I mean, we essentially have them now. We've got the batteries to store the power in. We just can't use them. Uh, but we have solar panels on our roof. They, they're simple. They don't make any noise. They don't kill anyone. Um, there was some manufacturing in them, of course, but you know, they're going to pay for themselves yeah. environmentally very quickly. No, the simplicity and speed of solar, wind and batteries, um, it's insane. No competition. All right. So this week I got kind of excited because there was a tweet sent out by Ford and, uh, not to keep picking on Ford too much, but they have a Ford Mustang account on Twitter and they posted a teaser image. It's like, oh, there's going to be a big Ford Mustang announcement tomorrow. And because they make an electric Ford Mustang, I assumed this was going to be another electric Mustang and maybe like a souped up sports car version of the electric Mustang or something. But uh, no, it is absolutely not. It is a big V8 monster called the GTD. That's uh, they're going to start making them in very small quantities, uh, 800 horsepower V8 engine in a Mustang with, you know, special kind of racing accoutrement on it. Um, and they're going to sell it for $300,000. Uh, probably not too many of them. No, this is a limited quantity thing. And of course, there's huge, you know, Mustang fans out there. So they're definitely going to sell these. So sure. I can't say from a business perspective, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's a terrible decision. They're going to probably make money on this, but um, I don't know. That's time and energy that they could have spent working on something uh, electric when we're clearly at the end of the life of the, the V8 engine. I mean, these are cool. I, I like sports cars. I like fast cars. Like, this is undeniably cool. It'd be cool to see one of these driving around a t track somewhere, but um, it's just disappointing that Ford would spend their uh, time and effort on this. Yeah, it's a distraction and probably not going to do a whole lot for their company image in the long run as they think it will, probably. Yeah. And, you know, they've muddied the waters by having the electric Mustang. So, like I said, I got very excited about it. And, of course, they could build an electric version of this instead. That would be a, a lot more uh, interesting to me. And they could sell it for $300,000. But, um, yeah, for whatever reason, they're, they're going the old-fashioned route. But, anyway, this puts me onto another story that came out recently um, the average price of a new car in Canada, this is from the Globe and Mail, uh, now $66,000 is the average price of a new car in Canada. Um, we've heard recently in the, in the U S it's about $46,000. That's because so everybody's buying trucks. They're buying, they're buying pickup bigger, trucks, more expensive trucks. And I think also because the supply chain 
has limited the number of vehicles in the last year that the the dealerships have been able to kind of sell all of their stock for kind of the maximum price because they've they've been uh, you know supply constrained so it's actually been good news for like US auto dealers in the last year or two uh, they've been kind of making more profit than they normally make on their cars because of the the limited supply but uh, yeah but nevertheless that was pretty shocked by that 66,000 as the the average price in Canada and 46 in the US and if you do the conversion that's still a little bit more um, money in Canada than it is in the US for the uh, the average new car Get yourself an EV if you're going to spend any kind of money on a new car. My God, there's yeah, for sixty six thousand you can get an excellent EV. And I love EVs. I I I just I'm constantly even when I drive my old Leaf, I'm still liking it. You know, I'm just it's just such a pleasure to drive, and I can't say enough. I wanted to acknowledge the Canadian wildfires in Kelowna, BC, and in Yellowknife, which has been evacuated in the territory of Yukon. Uh, I drove through Kelowna for the first time in my life, saw it for the first time in my life, and wildfires were a concern. But we missed it by a few days, you know, we because they're yeah. telling tourists not to go to that part of the country. We, we got a, like a month before my trip, I couldn't get a hotel room in that area. That whole Kamloops interior of BC, I couldn't get a hotel room. Yeah. So yeah, they need those for people who are displaced. And yeah, it's just an ugly ugly situation no and meanwhile the whole city of Yellowknife has been evacuated 20,000 people and there's not a close place for them to go they're getting, they're driving for tw like 24 hours to get to Edmonton um, not a great situation hopefully it improves some of the rain is maybe going to come through from California of course massive flooding in California from their weird storm um, that happened this week so uh, this is quickly becoming a weather podcast yeah, it is. <laughs> we should have our own weather channel. Um, you know, I looked I looked up north there to see what the EV situation was like from plug share to see what the charges were like. Yeah. And there's not really a good way to get out of Yellowknife to Edmonton uh, at this time, but they are building some things. Yeah, that is a pretty obscure northern route. So it doesn't surprise me that there's there's no chargers, but eventually it'll come. But there are chargers there in the town of Yellowknife. Yeah. And I'd have to wonder, though, because, you know, they put gas trucks along the highway of people evacuating and temporary gas stations for people to fill up along that route. And they were not, there was no lineup at first, but then at some points there was two or three hours of wait just to get gas. Yeah. But what would that would be like if everybody had EVs? I mean, that would be yeah. kind of difficult. I mean, I guess you could technically pull over somewhere that had a normal plug-in and, and plug in your EV and you'd you know, end up waiting for a day maybe to get enough charge to get to the next yeah. place. But it's something. Maybe in the future when everyone has an EV, there will be emergency trucks that drive around that can tie into the grid or even have batteries to charge everyone. Yeah. Um, that's Tesla has deployed temporary superchargers uh, on occasion, so such a thing could exist. Yeah, so Yellowknife is in the Northwest Territories, right? And Whitehorse is in Yukon, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Or is it the other way right. around? Uh, Damn it. I, don't, <laughs> I didn't know there was going to be a quiz. I know. I, I'm sorry up north, you guys. But uh, in the city of Whitehorse, which I consider going to as well. Yeah, I've been to Whitehorse. It's lovely. Yeah, it is Yukon. Because they're, the government of the Yukon has... Um, it's right next to Alaska. So it, it, the government has put up all these EV chargers. They have more than you and I do in our province down here and a 30th of the population and they have more chargers Wow! and they don't go anywhere because it stops at the border because nobody else is picking up the slack, but they tried. I mean, good on you, Yukon. Um, that's impressive. Here is the tweet of the week as we run long this week. <laughs> This is from Polling Canada, quoting a Angus Reid poll. Climate change is fact plus caused by humans, 67% of the population. Fact and caused by natural changes, in other words, not human, 22%. Not proven theory is 7%. So a lot of people in Canada, and maybe now is a good time to... <laughs> convince them that climate change is real. I've seen people on Twitter saying, oh, wow, this is really serious. We should do something. Well, wake up, you morons. Yeah. Come on. How but could you not know what is going on in the world? It takes this to happen. So all these wildfires are directly linked to climate change. Uh, agree 
almost 60% disagree, 33%. Brian well, is tiny. Bad. I mean, that's, you know, almost two thirds. No, it's good. But I mean, does it take this to make it happen? I don't know. You know I think, let, unfortunately, it does. Let's dig into the mailbag here and see what we have. This one's from Stephen. You want to read it? Yeah. So Stephen says, I'm a listener and Econut from far away Winnipeg, which is not that far. Um, I've applied much of the same technologies, like a super insulated straw bale home in 2007 with a cold climate heat pump this year and one Nissan Leaf that uh, they've had for 10 years and a two-year-old Tesla. And uh, he says, my wife happens to be on a holiday with her sister in England, and I thought about getting a tea kettle instead of a t-shirt. This for our new smaller cottage that is in the planning stage, and it is easy to have a 240-volt plug in it. And... Uh, but is asking me, couldn't see how I adapted my UK kettle, uh, you know, something rated for 3,000 watts. How do you adapt that to a North Not American? Not only are you a light bulb expert, you're the resident <laughs> tea kettle expert. Yes. Well, you know, this is a thing that uh, I thought that I had invented maybe, but, I, you know, I've since learned that other people have done this. But, uh, and apologies to everybody who uh, gets bored. Who by doesn't care about tea? Going on about light bulbs <laughs> and uh, electric kettles. But these are basically my two hobbies, um, you know, light bulbs and uh, uh, electric kettles. But anyway, so... Yeah, what I did, just to clarify, so here in North America, we're basically stuck with 1,500 watts if you want an electric kettle. And if you drink tea, you really want an electric kettle. That's at 120 volts in yeah, our system. 120 volts. It's kind of the limitations of our standard kind of system. But over in the UK, their standard system is 220 or 240 volts. So 3,000 watt kettles are very common in the UK. So what I did was buy a kettle from Amazon UK and uh, brought it over here. I had my electrician put in a 240 volt outlet in my kitchen. And there's different sizes of those. Like there's there's large 240 outlets for like you can plug in a dryer and that those are good to charge EVs. Or an electric, but, yeah. Yeah. Electric but, car charger. But there's smaller ones too. So these are not, these are kind of normal sized, but the, the configuration of pins is slightly different and they can do 240 volts. So you get one of these 240 volt plugs in your kitchen and then you have to cut off the UK plug off the end of your kettle. This is... Uh, really? Yeah. And well, that's pretty serious for two, all that electricity. Yeah. But, you know, I had an electrician here a few years ago doing some other work and I asked him about this. I said, hey, is this possible? Do you think you can do this? And he said, gee, that's a great idea. And he actually did it in his own house first uh, really? before he did mine. Yeah. He thought it was such a great idea. He ordered the kettle. So, um, yeah, but you have to cut off the, the UK plug because you can't put in a UK plug in North America. So you cut off the UK plug, you take out the wires, and you wire it up to a North American 240 volt plug. You, you stick that on, and then you can stick it into your outlet. So as far as I know, there's no kind of simple adapter that you can do. You have to physically cut off the plug. So don't do it unless you're an electrician. Um, I was able to do it the a second time. So our first kettle died. So I had to buy another one from the UK. But I, I took apart the first one and I saw how he had connected the wires. So I was able to do the second one myself. But, uh, you know, please get an electrician to do it. I don't want anyone to get electrocuted uh, from this. Because but, of us. <laughs> yeah, but it's awesome having a 3,000 watt kettle. It's We've had it probably 10 years, well, maybe not 10 years, five, six, seven years. And uh, couldn't imagine living without it. So why did it break? If you using that that much? Did, did you buy the same, different brand this time? Um, it was a kind of a cheap one, and it rusted through, and it started leaking water out the bottom. Uh, I mean, you know, appliances are not made well, but the the second one has lasted five or six years now so far. So it's not electrical related. Yeah, it's it's just just rusted yeah. through. Okay, well, that's good. Did you get back to him? Did you let him know that uh, that's what he can do? Yes, I sent him an email, and now of course he can. Uh, hear it again on the podcast it's time for the lightning round the lightning round is a fast-paced look at the latest headlines in climate clean energy and transportation golly we're running late this week but this is good because we're off next week everyone brian and i are going to take another week off of vacation brian is traveling and we thought why not uh, you can handle it. But we've got an extra show for you this week. Ford Motor Company is joining with two battery component makers to build a cathode active material plant in Quebec, Canada, worth more than $1.2 billion. So you're just throwing around the billions here like crazy. And some provinces turn them down. 
So anyway, Honda confirms it will adapt Tesla's NACS adapter driven by GM's adoption. So, f yeah, but where's he Where's Kia and Hyundai? I mean, where are they? Have you read anything? Yeah, I haven't heard anything, but this is looking like a done deal with the NACS as the default uh, for North America, which is great. Okay, it's time for some nuclear news. Some more nuclear news. Japan will begin a contentious plan to release treated wastewater from the wrecked Fukushima nuclear reactor into the Pacific Ocean on August 24th. And no, they're not just dumping it. They're trickling it out for 30 years. Because everything in nuclear takes a long time, including when you're contaminating the planet. Uh, Tokyo Electric Power Company says that uh, they can start the process to discharge 1.3 million cubic meters of water, equivalent to about 500 Olympic-sized swimming pools of juicy radioactive water over a period of 30 years. And if they do it over 30 years, they should avoid a Godzilla situation. I... No guarantees. Claims for weather-related incidents are set to exceed $100 billion for the third year in a row as floods, hail, and wildfires linked to climate change become more frequent. I was looking at the charger at my first hotel, and in the background was a Chevy dealership. And at that dealership, they had hard covers to put over their cars. I, I think I mentioned this before. But hmm. they've got these hard canopies now that they've spent a great deal of money on. Because they're losing. I mean, you lost your car to hail yep. because of the same thing, right? I mean, you had a Tesla ready to go in Calgary, and it got killed along with like 40 other cars. And, okay. So the output for nuclear power has fallen by around a third in the past decade due to aging reactors. Uh, Clean Tech again reminds us that Tesla will have bi-directional charging in all EVs by 2025. And it was mentioned casually at their March Investor Day, but really not discussed. Do you remember hearing that? Because it sort of got by a lot of people. Yeah, I don't quite remember that. It's something they haven't been too hot on, but by 2025? Yeah, sure, why not? The UN's resident coordinator for Kenya gets the Hyundai Ionic 5 as an official vehicle. So I say, I can't have enough of that. We need people in power driving electric vehicles to know what it's like. And finally this week, the numbers are truly impressive. Solar generation experienced an impressive growth, soaring nearly 20-fold from um, 20, 2,600 gigawatt hours. You know, that's 2,600 hours of a nuclear reactor to astonishing almost 50,000 gigawatt hours in California. Wind generation demonstrated a commendable increase of 63%. On the other hand, there was a substantial decline in natural gas generation for the state, 20% down, and coal has been gradually phased out of the power mix altogether, marking a significant shift. In addition to contributing to the total utility generation, rooftop solar has experienced exponential phenomenal growth of 10 times in 2022. A remarkable progress for... Uh, that has resulted in a generation of 24,000 gigawatt hours of clean power. That is a lot of rooftop solar when you think about all those things putting out, you know, a couple of dozen nuclear power plants worth at their peak. And governments can try and slow this stuff down, but they will not stop it. Thank you for listening. We appreciate you coming along for the ride for the show. As I said, that is it for this week, but we will be back in two weeks. And then probably, you know, after that, you're going to be from a remote location in the United States. Yeah, see you in two weeks from Telluride, Colorado. Our United States correspondent, Brian Stockton, will be digging deep into the United States. If you're there or in the area, contact us and uh, we'll figure something out if you want to, uh, I don't know, brush fingers with... Um, Mr. Stockton or something, or if you're at the film festival, take the time to contact us. Clean at a show. Gmail.com is the best way. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel for special features. And the clean energy store is there in your show notes. If you'd like to sport the merchandise and, and support our show as well in a small way. Uh, if you're new to the show, remember to subscribe on your podcast app, which is what we always do. You can always rate and review us. That helps us. So see you next time. Yeah. See you in two weeks.
Show. 